Just by way of announcement, before we get into our worship time, let me give you a few announcements to think about. First and foremost, there is a surge with COVID right now, and so please be careful with one another, all right? Wear masks where you know that it's necessary, and as you're greeting people, be very sensitive. My friends, if we love each other, we'll be sensitive. You understand that? Everybody understand that? Amen. All right, good. Uh, breakfast Sunday School was amazing this morning. I was overwhelmed by that. Please seek to be careful with distances, as uh, even in the social hall. Missionaries, praise the Lord, we have some great missionaries. Today, uh, David Mason, three years of planning and fundraising, six months of construction, multiple city council meetings, revisions and exemptions. Finally, we can say after all this time that our project is complete. We received our certificate of occupancy the last week of this month. A newly expanded center is ready to go. He's ministering to these great military men and military fellowship. Go back to the back table, grab a hold of his letter, and go through that. The Wingers, praise the Lord, are on their way. Praise God. Yeah. We finished the intercultural studies program <coughs> online. We certainly not fluent in Spanish, but we're what we need to be. They're headed to Chile. All they need is a little bit of help. Uh, we're temporarily living in the Stolfus Villa Missionary House at Twin Valley Bible Baptist and uh, working uh, hard in and around the ministry there, uh, abiding their time until they're able to get to the field. Pray for your missionaries. How many of you pray for the missionaries? Okay, good. Praise the Lord. Continue to do that. God is certainly good. This evening is family fun night. Family fun night. How many of you enjoy Sunday night? Amen. Woo, isn't it amazing? And tonight we're going to enjoy a great time, great music, great fellowship. We're going to do the old-fashioned country choir. How many of you really like the old-fashioned country choir? We're going to have some fun tonight and enjoy fellowship with one another. Evangelism all week, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Come and be a part of it. Gifts right now. At the end of the service, we'll be doing this. I think it's so neat to see all of these gifts. It's just beautiful. And everyone here, everybody is enough for everybody. Grab a hold of a gift, and uh, at the end, whatever is left will be giving away to children here and there, and uh, the adults also. Pray for Jay Hornsby. We found out that he has terminal cancer, and he'll be passing probably within days. Uh, so keep sharing in prayer. That's the reason she's not here today. Pray for Connie Peterson's family. Uh, her, uh, she has passed. Also, Chris and Funeral Home will be having her service Thursday night. Uh, at 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock, and I just want to invite you, I'll be doing that service, and I hope that you'll be a part of it, uh, just asking that the Lord will bless and give us wisdom as we continue through. Jason Hastings, I deeply appreciate you. I've been joking about him getting me a microwave yeah. for today. He actually did it. <laughs> Is that a real microwave? <laughs> Jason, you are awesome. It's not painful to do. <laughs> God bless you, brother. Hey, let's pray together. Father, as we get ready to go into our worship time today, we glorify you for Kamar, who is being baptized today. Lord, bless him, give him strength as we continue in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Tom, play you are God. And as you're just seated right there, we're going to listen and sing you are God as Kamar gets ready to come. To be back.
talked this morning and realize what you're doing, I'm overwhelmed with it, and I praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.
if you will, and we'll sing joy to the world together. We'll do the video hymn, The Greatest Story Ever Told. Ladies, do two offertories tonight, okay? How's that? <laughs> oh, can you do another tonight? All right, listen, what we're trying to do is get to the preacher, because you know what the main thing is for Amen. us, especially on Sunday morning, to hear the preacher. word of God, okay? So let's be praying and asking the Lord to bless in that. Go ahead, Gary, will you? We'll sing the first and the last. Joy to the world. exalt you today. Amen. You are to be praised. Amen. 
I'm afraid, dear Lord God, in our country that you've lost your praise. Amen. I'm concerned, dear Lord God, that our nation has gone one way or the other, either so legal that no more is there work than the services of your churches, or so absolutely crazy that all there is is nonsense and foolishness and wickedness. And, oh, God, I just ask that you forgive our country. Amen. Father, forgive this church where we err, dear Lord God, for certainly we're not perfect in any way, shape, or form. I'd ask, oh, Father, that you'd forgive us as well, that you'd help us to maintain the warmth of worship before you. Lord, so many are going to be shocked when we get to heaven where there's such reverence and such care in the way things are done, and yet this incredible balance of of warmth and praises and hand raising and, and shouts of glory and oh God may we find that balance once again Father may our nation understand that now on this earth we are preparing for those days yeah. they're not something far off they're very close and oh precious King may it be that soon we'll get it that we'll understand that there's a needy <coughs> wisdom that must come from you to bring about salvation. That you, Father God, want to work through human beings to do your work. I don't understand that. I never have. But I'm grateful that you do. Yes. Use us, God, to be out in the street with such a fervor in our tone with the lost that they yearn to be like it, dear Lord God. That they yearn to have the truth of the gospel surging through them. And Lord, that the Holy Spirit would convict and that you would draw men unto yourself, for certainly nothing can happen unless you work, unless you do your job, dear Lord God, through us. Yes. Father, I'm ashamed yes. that oftentimes I don't let you. Mm -hmm. I'd ask, Father, that we all would let you have us. We'd let you work. Do your work today. Yeah. In Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Have a seat, if you will. It is... An honor to have my father-in-law here. I'm grateful for him, uh, and I'm so glad that you decided to be with us today. We have quite a few families that are away, but we have some visitors too, and I'm so glad to see you. And I was grateful to look over here also at the Haitian ministry and see their area filling up, and I'm grateful for what God is doing. If you're a first-time visitor here with us, would you just slip your hand up? Maybe the first time, okay, over here, over there, yes. And you in the back, very good. Praise the Lord. God bless you. I'm going to ask that our ushers who are in the back, that they grab a hold of some visitors' cards. You see Richard coming now. And just hand those out, if you will, to folks who need visitors' cards. Miss Sharon Gray has been such a blessing to me. And she's going to work out a way for us to treat our visitors a little bit better. Isn't that right? And uh, she's making up packets as we are in these weeks, and she's going to start doing some things to develop that ministry. As you know, it's only a 27-month experience for me here in this church, and I'm seeing God do some great things. But there's still quite a bit of development that needs to take place, and we're just asking that the Lord will do that over time. I'm thankful for that. Dad, come on up here, man, if you will. Uh, Dr. T. Reynolds Hall pastored over in, my goodness, in Shawnee, Kansas, in Shawnee uh, Mission, Kansas, as well as in um, Omaha, as well as in Michigan, as well as in Alabama. He was down with us when we were at, on, on the field, as well as been over in Africa. And I am grateful to have him here. Why don't you give him a first value share? Hey! Thank you, Barry, and thank you for the privilege of being with you. We have prayed for you and continue to pray for you, and of course you would expect that since we have family involved in this ministry. And we're excited about what God is doing and uh, anticipating greater things as God continues to work in your midst. It's my privilege to be with you this morning. It's always a privilege to open the Word of God and share the burden of my heart from God's Word to the people of God. And I trust that God will use this service to be a blessing uh, to each one. I've had the opportunity to meet some of you. I'd love to meet more of you. Uh, but you're on our hearts. And in our prayers, we continue to hold you before the Lord. And ask that God would do a great work. I want to draw your attention this morning to one of what I call the greatest chapters in the New Testament. 
Now, you probably have that a favorite chapter in the New Testament, or maybe your favorite chapters in the Old Testament. It's sort of a, with mixed emotions that I pick a favorite chapter, uh, because they're all so good and uh, so powerful in the Word of God. But I want you to turn, please, in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of introduction to uh, the theme that I want to uh, share with you this morning, the burden on my heart. Uh, the Apostle Paul, of course, is God's servant, and he's writing to uh, the, the church at Corinth. He has a burden on his heart in Corinth. He uh, was grieved because of their lack of maturity and growth. Uh, he was grieved because for so long they remained babes in Christ. He said, I had a burden to share all of the rich blessings of God, all the truths of God's word. That, that's a burden on my heart, but I couldn't do it because you weren't ready for that. Uh, now when we get to the second uh, letter of Paul to the church at Corinth, uh, he shares some of the great truths, but he does it from a heart that's burden for the people to whom he's writing. And his motive, as God lays it upon his heart, ought to be your motive and mine when it comes to our sharing the word of God. That is to let God work in our hearts, let that empty out into the hearts of others as we bear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and God works in their heart. That's what's going to help our country in these days. We, we, we are in sad shape. Yeah. Uh, we, we've certainly grieved the heart of God. Yes, we've sir. turned our backs on God. We've taken His Word out of the public arena. And uh, if now, uh, if you stand for the truths of God's Word and publicly proclaim it, you'll be accused of hate crime. Right. Right. There are certain things that we shall, we shall uh, share with others at our own peril. Mm. But let's be faithful in doing it. Paul was. And we need to be that today. That's the only hope of our country. God is the only hope Amen. for America. Amen. That's right. And if there's going to be a genuine heaven sent Holy Spirit revival, then God's going to have to work in the hearts of you and me and others like us all across this nation. There's a price to pay. And the question that comes to our hearts, are we willing to pay the price? That's the question. In the Second Corinthians chapter 5, Paul begins the epistle. What I'm going to do, I, I, I'm going to share, first of all, a little attitude of Paul, his heart attitude in the first part of Second Corinthians 5. Not going to take much time there. Then I'm going to skip to the last part of Second Corinthians chapter 5 and share uh, the heart of God, which ought to be our hearts as well. And the challenge that God gives us there. Then I'm going to come back to what I call the pivotal verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to speak to you this morning on this theme, this subject. Three little big words. Three little big words. And it's in that pivotal verse, what I call the pivotal verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. But I want you to notice, first of all, the heart of the one who's sharing this great truth as the Spirit of God laid it upon his heart. I want you to see Paul's attitude, his heartfelt attitude. And I would to God that that would be your heartfelt attitude and mine. And I'm going to ask you, is it? When we look at these, I'm going to ask you, is that your heart attitude? Are these things true in your life as a believer? Now, if you're here without Christ, then those things really aren't true. You don't know that truth. But I hope before you leave this place today, you will know Christ as your personal yeah, Savior, yeah, if you don't already. Yeah. And you'll have that uh, heart that Paul had as he shared it with the believers in Corinth. Now, when I get to that biblical verse, that verse is going to affect you one way or another. It's either going to make you glad... Or it's going to make you sad. Or it's going to make you mad. Come on. Come on. Now don't get mad at me. It's going to make you glad if you know the reality of what it's speaking of. It's going to make you sad if you don't know that. And I would say if you don't. 
don't know the reality of it, don't go to that third attitude and get mad. Just get right. Hey, just yeah. get right with God. Yeah, yeah, and then you can enjoy the gladness of what God has done for us. Right. Let me put it another way. It's either going to uh, comfort you, challenge you, or convict you. It's either going to comfort you, challenge you, or convict you. Now, that attitude of being mad will result if you don't give in to the convicting power of the Spirit of God yes, sir. and let Him do what He wants to do in your heart. That's right. Because yeah. if you give in to the prompting of the Spirit of God, let Him have His way in your heart and in your life, mm -hmm. then you'll leave glad. Come on. Yep. Rejoicing yeah. in the things of God. Amen. But now let's lay some groundwork. Look at the very first uh, verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As the Apostle Paul uh, begins under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to share his heart and get to that pivotal point in this chapter as I see it. In verse number one, Paul begins, For we know. Now, let me tell you what he's talking about. You can read that. We're not going to have time to do that this morning. You would do well to read that chapter slowly, carefully. Read it with the Spirit of God giving you the understanding. Hope is certain about some things. I mean, he's got that settled. And what he's got settled, as he mentions, for we know, he's talking about what happens after we die. Or what happens after the rapture of the church and God takes us home. There are a lot of folks who are afraid of death. Don't talk to me about death. I, had, uh, I preached a funeral one time. This was an executive with United Airlines. I, I really didn't know him personally. The family contacted me, and I preached his funeral. And it came to my attention before that that this executive, this was years ago, this executive of United Airlines never wanted anybody to talk to him about death. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to face it. But the fact is, he died. Yeah. And I preached his funeral. He died, never giving thought about where he's going to spend each other. As far as I know, rejecting Christ. Now, Paul says, hey, I'm certain about this. We know if this temple, this body, this building be destroyed, we have one made, in, not with hands, eternal in the heaven. Paul said, I know what's going to happen to me when I leave this whole world, whether it be through the rapture of the church or to the portal of death. I know, I'm certain about that. So he asked the question, are you certain? Don't, don't, don't answer unless you can really evaluate what's going on in your heart. Are you know for sure that when this life is over for you, you're going to heaven when you die? You can know that. You can know it based on the promises of God's word. Paul says, I'm certain about this. And here, let me tell you about it. He goes on with quite a few verses there and describes it. No wonder Paul could say, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. No wonder Paul said, I'm caught between two things. Whether to go on to glory or to stay here, which might be beneficial to you. And he just left it with God. That's what we have to do. Right. We just leave that matter with God. God Amen. take care of that. So Paul says, I'm certain. I want to be sure. Before you leave this place today, that you're certain. And you can be. That you're on your way to heaven. Yeah. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul was certain. Notice also, just a little later, if we drop down to verses 6 and 8, Paul was confident. Now, I like a confident person. Now, I'm not talking about someone that, that boasts and brags and uh, brags on himself, but I'm talking about someone that's confident. If I were in the market for an employee, I'd work that employee to know what this job is all about and what's expected of it. Right. And then I would want that employee to assure me I can handle it. I can do it. 
Paul was confident. His confidence was based in the Lord. Look at these two verses of Scripture. First, verse number six. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Paul said, I'm confident of that. As, as long as I, God needs me here, I'm confident of it. That when this time is over, I'll be with him. He laid it before God. He had it settled in his heart. And he lived his life with confidence. You ought to be a confident Christian. You ought to have confidence in the power of God. Confidence in the word of God. Confidence in the leading and prompting and empowerment by the spirit of God. You ought to live a confident life, are you? Are you a confident Christian? You ought to be. We all ought to be. But notice further, Paul goes on. He says, not only am I certain of these things and confident of these things, but verse 9. Now, I'm going to put in another word for the sake of alliteration because it's easier for you to remember four C's <coughs> than four different words. But the word means exactly what Paul is talking about. The Spirit of God laid upon his heart. Paul said, I am careful. I am careful. You can put another word in there. It would serve just as well. I am cautious. Paul was living a careful and cautious life. Why? Because he says, I want to know, I want to have the sweet assurance that I am acceptable to God. And that word acceptable has a, 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 a very precious meaning that would uh, make it easy for you to apply to your heart. Paul says, I want to be well-pleasing unto the Lord. Oh, yeah. I don't know how it is in your prayer life. I, I, have, said, I have said so often that, that I'm ashamed of my prayer life. I'm ashamed that I don't pray more. That I don't pray more faithfully, more diligently. I want to. I know that. God is dealing with me on that. And I want to be that kind of a prayer warrior. But God often will work in my heart on some particular theme or some word. And that, that, will, that will just come out in my prayer time with the Lord. My, just my time with God. Just individually, just me and God. And sometime back, maybe, uh, maybe three or four months back now, God impressed upon my heart the urgency and the importance of living to please Him. It's easy to live to please self. It's a little more difficult, but still relatively easy to live to please somebody else. First and foremost, I'm not all that concerned about pleasing you. If I have a choice, if I'm given the choice, and I am given the choice of pleasing you, or pleasing God, I'll take God every time. Yes. What I would love to be so is that I can live to please God and please you at the same time. You see, if our hearts are beating sympathetically together, for the cause of Christ, for the love of God. If our hearts are doing that, if our lives are doing that, then when I please God, I'll please you. And when you please God, you'll please me. But Paul said, I am careful to please God. You know Paul didn't always please everybody. I'm sure there were some believers, a number of unbelievers, in Corinth that Paul didn't preach. But he pleased God. That's what counts. So he, he lived a, a concerned, a confident, a careful life before God, a committed life to God. But notice further. Paul doesn't stop there. When we go just a little bit further, Paul lived a constrained life. Then you know that, that, what that word means. It means held in within the traces. I mean, uh, it means the bit and bridle is guiding your direction. It means that you are constrained. You are locked in to pleasing God, walking with God, 
and you are constrained to do so by the love of God. The love of God constrains me, Paul said. No wonder he could declare, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the power of God, and the salvation. To everyone that believes to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Why? Because he was constrained. He never forgot what happened to him on the Damascus Road. He never forgot the change that was wrought in his life. He never forgot that. He was constrained. He was locked in by that. Oh, my dear fellow believer, don't ever lose sight of what God has done for you. The change that's wrought by faith in the living God to save your poor soul. Paul was constrained. Now, that's his attitude. That's describing his attitude as he works his way to what I call the pivotal verse in this chapter. I'm going to bypass that verse for a while, and I'm going to go down to the last part. I look at this last part. It deals with a great theme, the theme of reconciliation. <laughs> reconciliation. And the thrust of that is reconciliation between sinful man and the holy and righteous God. Amen. Reconciliation. In this text of Scripture, I used a, I used a phrase that I was a little concerned about whether I should use it or not in referring to this great theme of the latter part of chapter 2 to chapter 5. And I said reconciliation, a work of God, a work of God through His Son, Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. made everyone in this whole world saved. Now, hear me out. I didn't say everyone's going to get saved. I, I don't believe in universal worldwide salvation. The Bible doesn't teach it. And I don't believe it. Amen. But God did make every individual saved. Yeah. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that's everybody, yeah. believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Right. I am come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what the Lord Jesus said. He had a burden. He said, I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to me. That's the heart of God. Yeah. So what is he going to do about that? What is the approach? Because sinful man in and of himself is not saved. That's right. There's nothing he could do. Oh, there's a text of Scripture. Paul is dealing, uh, he's writing to the believers at Ephesus. And he says, remember, remember how it was before you heard the gospel. Remember how it was before you received Christ as your personal Savior. Just remember how it was when you were unsaved. And then he tells us some things to describe the lost person's condition. He says you were without hope. Every day, simple expression, isn't it? To be without hope. Hope. Suppose you had no hope. You were hopeless. Nothing could be done about it. You're utterly without hope. And then he says, without God. In this world, living as so much, so many of the unsaved in this world today, living without hope for eternity, living without God as if God did not exist, the creator of all mankind. And person couldn't seem to care less. But he says, that's how you work. You're without hope. He, he says further, in reference to Israel, you were aliens. That means you weren't citizens. You didn't have the promises that God had given to Israel. Gentiles. Now, it doesn't mean that God wasn't concerned. God was using. God's desire of Israel was to raise up a nation that would obey him, that would serve him, and be a testimony to the world. I mean, the classic example of that would be uh, Jonah going to preach to men. Jonah didn't want to go, but God wanted it there. He wanted those people at Nineveh to repent and trust him. He's concerned. He's concerned. Without hope, without God, alienated strangers to the covenants of promise. That's every Gentile. And a Gentile simply is one who's not a Jew. 
as the Bible used uh, the word. So, this matter of reconciliation then is a tremendous word. I want you to notice several things. First of all, I want you to notice in the text of Scripture, down in the latter part uh, of, the, of the chapter, that there is this matter of reconciliation. What is it all about? Then there's this ministry of reconciliation. Right. And then there is this message of reconciliation. And then there is this mandate for reconciliation. Now let's take those four, and then we'll get that to that pivotal verse in just a moment. Let's take those four. The ministry, the matter, the matter of reconciliation is all of God. It's God's work. Nobody can do it but God. No one can reconcile himself to God. You can't reconcile yourself to God. I can't reconcile myself to God. I'm a sinner. All I can do is do what Isaiah did in, as recorded for us in chapter 6, that great book of promise. Woe is me, for I am a man of unseen lips, and I live in the midst of people with unseen lips. And yet God in his mercy and his grace touched that coal off the altar, off the altar of his lips, and it was clean. God did a work in his heart. If you want to read carefully, Isaiah chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, Isaiah is pretty hard. Now he's trying to the inspiration of the Spirit of God, but he's pretty hard against Judah. I mean, read, read in the fifth chapter what God has to say about Israel, my vineyard. I did everything possible for them. Everything, everything imaginable, I did for them. And I looked at this vineyard would bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. No good fruit. What more could have been done, God says. God's done everything possible for us. Everything within the scope of his holiness, his power, his love, his mercy, and his grace, God has done for us. The work of reconciliation is God's work for lost mankind. How did he do it? He did it through his son, Jesus Christ. Christmas in July is all about that. It's all about what God did through his son, Jesus Christ. He took upon himself a debt that we could not pay and he did not owe. And he died in our place. The substitutionary work of the Lamb of God, dying for me. Isaiah 53 tells us all about it. What a wonderful one. He did it. He did that work of reconciliation. Now he says, through Jesus Christ, I reconciled a world of sinners to myself. Doesn't mean a world of sinners are saved. It doesn't say that. He's made them savable. He's made them savable. Now the decision comes whether we'll take that gift of God or not. Yes. That is. But now he says, Paul says, and he's given to me the message of reconciliation. Uh, before that, Paul had a bird laid on his heart. And he said, God has given me a ministry of reconciliation. In other words, I'm to preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world that they might be saved. God says, I, it's not my desire that anyone would go to hell, but that all would be saved. He has a burden on his heart for a world, dead, lost, and trespassing to sins. So this ministry of reconciliation is accompanied by the word of reconciliation. That's the gospel. For the gospel is the power of God and the salvation of everyone who lives. That's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't end there. Here's where you and I come into play. He's given us the mandate of reconciliation. He's put that as a responsibility that we have as a believer. I want to read that text of scripture. And you'll, you'll just highlight it in your own mind or in your own Bible. But notice beginning with verse number 19. Oh, go back to verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath 
reconcile us to himself. Notice that now. Who, that's God, who had reconciled us to himself. That's God's work. That's God's work. That's the matter of reconciliation. And he did it by Jesus Christ and had given to us the ministry of reconciliation. When Paul says us, who is he talking about? Who's he talking about? Us as Christians. Every believer. Every believer. He's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. But notice further, to it, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses against them, and had committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That's the gospel. Amen. That's the good news of the gospel. That's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ yes. who died for sinners. Amen. Amen. He's committed that to us. We have the message. Yes. It's been committed unto the every believer. Lord. But it doesn't stop there. Notice. Lord. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Amen. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. Now, there's my word that's committed to me, God's word committed to me, my responsibility to go out and reach the lost with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And pray and plead and urge them to be reconciled to God. God's already reconciled the world to himself. Now it's the sinner's responsibility to be reconciled to God. In other words, to want a right, a right relationship with Jesus Christ. That is to be saved. To be born again of the Spirit of God. Now that's how the chapter nearly ends. I'm saving that last verse on purpose. I want to go back up to verse 17. Let me say a couple of things about that verse. You'll find these three little Big words mentioned in that verse. <clears throat> if I give you just a couple of minutes and you look at the text, you know what they are. They all start with an I. They all only have two letters. And they're all contained in the first part of that verse. This verse includes what is generally called by the scholars a conditional clause. I'm not going into the details of the conditional clause. You probably understand what a conditional clause is. It has some conditions attached to it. If the first part of the, of the first clause is true, then the second part is true. If the first part is false, then the second part is false. And that's what Paul starts with. That's how the Spirit of God led him. And he starts it with if. There's the first big little word. If. Everything hangs on that if. In fact, all that's gone before that Paul talked about to be at the body to be present with the Lord, or I have, a, I have a home, I have a body in the heavenlies waiting for me. I know what's coming, I'm certain about that. All of that hinges on this gift for you and for me. If any man be in, that's the same. Big little word. In Christ. He is a new person. Old things have passed away, but all things have become new. If, in, it is. All right? Let's look at that little conditional clause. If any man be in Christ. the church and that puts you in Christ? Do you go through the orders of baptism and that puts you in Christ? No. No. The only one way to get in Christ. You are born into Christ by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. Under the convicting power of the Spirit of God and the yielding of yourself to Christ. The agreement. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. 
I was there and Christ died for me. He paid my penalty. He paid a debt he did not owe and one I could not pay. That's what we talk about, the voluntary, substitutionary death of Christ. He did it willingly for you, for poor lost sinners. If you're here this morning without Christ, if you'll say, I know I've sinned against God, no doubt about it. I know I need to be saved. I know I want to spend eternity in heaven. I believe Jesus died for me on Calvary's cross, paid the penalty for my sin, and offers to me forgiveness and cleansing from sin. I believe God will do what he said. I believe he'll save me. And you, by faith, receive Christ as your personal Savior. For by grace, you're saved through faith. That not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's the work of God. He did it. He reconciled the world to himself. If, 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 oh, the burden of my heart this morning is how do you answer that? One little, two little big word. If, is it true? But the second word, if, it can be in Christ. Now that's interesting because Paul, in his epistles, was led of the Spirit of God to use either in Christ or in him or in the beloved or in whom, in other words, these, these synonyms of in him, over 160 times. In fact, if I remember correctly, it's 164 times. He used that phrase, in him. Now, let's put the two together. If any man be in Christ, there's the second question. Are you in Christ? Are you in Have you received him as your personal Savior? Realizing he died in your place will defend of your sin and will cleanse you of all unrighteousness, forgive you of all of your sins, make you his dear child, and give you heaven as your eternal home. Are you in Christ? Born again the Spirit of God. John said to Nicodemus, Are not the best of the he must be born again. No one will even seek the kingdom of heaven without being born again the Spirit of God. Are you in Christ? Oh, that's a tremendous important question. If you don't know for sure, get it settled before another day. Yes. Get it settled at the first opportunity that God gives you. Get it settled now. Just in your heart before God. Say, oh, I believe you died for me. I believe you paid the bill of my sin. I need you as my personal Savior. I here and now receive you. Take my heart. Take my life. Use it for your glory. I'm yours. And he'll save you. I just want to be Now the third word is if any man be and that's man, woman, boy, or girl. If any man be in he is a new creature, yes. a new creation, a new work of God. He has God's nature dwelling with him. He has the Spirit of God that takes up residence within us to guide us into all truth, to convict and convince, to lead us in the way that we ought to go. I uh, I don't say this for your, your pity. I'm pitiful enough already. Uh, but I have, what do they call that? They tell me I have neuropathy. Neuropathy. Real neuropathy in both legs. All of the nerves are dead in both legs. And when the nerves are dead, the muscles decay. They go dead. Uh, neuropathy. Both legs. And uh, if I'm not careful, and I don't think about it, I take the wrong step and I go down. I just get caught off, off guard and I go down. Now, I, I, I read one day Psalm 119, 133. And I said, that's my verse, and I have claimed that promise. Order my steps in thy word, 
And let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Amen. Psalm 119, 133. Or my steps in thy word. Now, not just for neuropathy. I'm asking God, or my steps. Or the steps of my life Amen. in your word. And let not any iniquity have dominion, have control yeah. over me. I want to please God. Yeah. Yeah. Just like Paul, Amen. I want to please God. <clears throat> or my steps in thy word. Because God has made me a new creation yep. in Christ Jesus. Amen. He's made me a child of His. I belong to Him. Yeah. I'm His forever. Yeah. And don't worry about anybody else. I'm His. I belong to Him. I want to do what He wants me to do. I want to say what He wants me to say. Yeah. I want to go where He wants me to go. I want to be what He wants me to be. Yeah. Now, I don't do all that. I will please God. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The next verse tells us, and those new things, those all things are of God. Tie those two things together because if I lost a leg before I got saved, getting saved wouldn't give me a new leg. My old body just wouldn't be made all new, not till I get to glory. And so, so some of those things are going to remain, but that's not what it's talking about. Now I am a new creation in Christ, and the old things are passed away. I don't live the old life. I, I don't want to please the old life. I don't want to please the devil. I don't want to please self. I want to please God. Yeah. Old things are passed away. And all things, all new things God has given to me. Yes. All that I need to do what God wants me to do, He's given to me. Amen. God's commandments are always accompanied by God's divine enablement. Yes. What He commands us to do, He'll enable us to yes. do. It will lay it before Him. Yes. Let me get to the last verse.
Do you have that relationship or your child of years? You say, preacher, I, I don't think I do. I don't think I've never really trusted Christ as my Savior. Pray for me. I know I need to be saved. I don't think I've ever trusted Christ as my Savior. While heads about and eyes are closed, anyone in this congregation just wants to, just like the lift at the end, would say, preacher, pray for me. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm going to single you out. But if you say, God spoke to my heart, and that if, thank you, I see that hand, God bless you, appreciate it, I'm speaking to your heart, anyone else, if you're not sure about that, you're not sure about that, if, and it may be in Christ, he is a new creature, anyone else? Well, the perhaps the great majority here, and I trust this so, know Christ is in this matter of reconciliation, this ministry, this message, this mandate for reconciliation rests on us. May we be bound faith. Save that precious soul to those that need Christ, and may they get it settled today. Speak to our hearts, speak to my heart, that we might obey the mandate and look for a lost and dying world and say, Be ye reconciled to God. And we'll thank you and praise you for Jesus' sake. Yes. Amen. Amen. Would you stand together, dear ones, please? The Christians, won't you come down here? Christians, won't you come and pray for the lost? Won't you come and work through this issue of evangelism in your own heart? Won't you consider some of the hardships around us that face us right now in these United States and pray for this world? Pray for our present Christians, won't you come? I see others coming. Won't you come also, Christian? Get on your knees and pray for these United States. Pray for the lost. Be in prayer right now, as maybe there are one or two here that need Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Christians, won't you come? Please come and get on your knees, won't you? Or right there in your pew, get right down on your knees, or sit down and be in prayer, if you will, right now, even Christians. Dear unbelievers, Someone who might not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. There are Christians praying for you right now. There are a whole host of people here that are pulling for you, that love you, that want you to come to Him. If you're unsaved and you need to be sure you're headed to heaven, you say, I'm not sure I'm headed to heaven. Would you walk down this aisle right now? There are counselors here ready to talk with you. Would someone say, I'm not sure I'm saved? Slip your hand up if that's you right now. I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I'm not 100% sure that if I died right here in a pew with a heart attack, that I'd go to see Jesus. I'm not sure of it. Slip your hand up about you. Yes, yes. Would you do something for me, my dear brother? Would you come on down? Would you come on down? Come on down if you would. Yes. Anybody else? Say, I'm not sure. I want to be sure, but I'm not sure. I, I feel like I need to talk to somebody. Come on down. Join this one. Come on, brother, if you will. Right over here. Right over here. Come on over here. Talk with these gentlemen that are waiting for you. Anyone else? I'm not 100% sure I'm going to heaven. I don't have that security. Pray for me. Oh, pastor, I need to be sure today. Slip your hand up if that's you. Come on down if you will. If you need to be baptized, maybe someone say, I need to be baptized. Listen, man, I've got you all set. Brother, I've got you all set. You don't need to worry anything about it. You stay right where you're at because I know we're taking care of you next week. There are others that need to be baptized. Do you need to be baptized? Slip your hand up if that's you. I need to take that first step. I see your hand. I need to take that first step of obedience. Okay, good. Anybody else? I need to take that first step of obedience. Uh, come down here. Will you talk with the counselor about it? Make sure you know what you're doing as you take this step of obedience. Anyone? And then finally, if there's someone here that would say, Pastor, I haven't ever joined this church, but I know I need to be a part of a godly church where things are being done in the right way with God in charge, being the one that's the head of the church. I need you to uh, take me into the membership of this church. I'd like to be taken in to the membership of this church and treated as one of those beautiful members of First Baptist Church. If that's you, why don't you walk down this aisle? We'd love to deal with you. We'd love to talk with you about that. You're not required. You won't be 
harassed at all. We just want you to know that you're welcome. Anyone? Anyone? You say, I haven't ever joined a church, but I sure would like to. Slip your hand up if that's you. So, okay. Anybody? All right. Okay, that's fine. Well, I thank the Lord for your willingness, dear ones, to be praying. Amen. Pray for this one who has had some doubts. Pray for others who have indicated their need but did not walk forward. Let's do that now. Let's be in prayer. Father, we do thank you for the morning. I thank you for the tender hearts of First Baptist Church. I thank you, dear Lord God, for a group of people who allow themselves to be touched. Your word tells us that we need to weep and cry and be afflicted about our sin, about wrong things, about things in our hearts that ought not to be there. Lord, there isn't a person in this room that doesn't have something that needs to be dealt with because we are all sinners. And every day, every second, we're doing things that just aren't right. And so we do. We weep and we cry about our nation. We weep and we cry about our people here. We weep and we cry about the Christian community in these states. And I ask you, Father, please, to break hearts and give yourself the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Brad, can I have you come down here? Brother Dennis, can I have you come down here? Those of you who fell out visitors' cards, these two men will take your visitors' cards. You can just hold them up in the air. Uh, those of you who are brand new or first-time visitors, second-time visitors, if you fill out a card, these men are willingly going to take that card, okay? And so if you turn around going back, just go ahead and give them the card if you see, okay? Uh, Mark, my son, where are you? Stand up, Mark. This bearded wonder over here <laughs> is going to be preaching this evening as a precursor to my father's yeah. preaching, my father loves preaching. I'm excited about that. He's going to give us, uh, what is it, an hour and a half long sermon, something like that? No, I'm just kidding. About 10 minutes or so. And uh, he's just going to give us a charge from his heart. I'm grateful for that. Hey, get out Tuesday. What are we doing Tuesday night at 6 o'clock? That's right, we're doing some street preaching, getting out there talking to people about Jesus Christ. Great Richard's back there. Oh, yeah. I get excited about what happened at Walmart. There was a family, I believe, that is planning to come. Excited about that this last week. People who are sitting in your cars out there, we're grateful that you were here. And those that are watching online, we're grateful that you were with us today. If there's any way that we can serve you, won't you just talk with us? Why don't you contact us? Call my number. Look at the track that you received or the bulletin and give us a call. We love you. We'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock. The Lord give you his very good morning.